Hello. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I've been asked mostly to talk about terms related to religion and extremism, particularly around Islam. Um, but before I can do that, I, I think it, it's worth saying a few words first about the, the sort of most abstract concept that we have when we talk about these issues and something that um, Ms. Erdberg didn't touch on quite as much, um, which is sort of what we mean by extremism writ very broadly. Because ultimately, the sort of action move that we want to have definitionally is to be able to say, is this group an extremist group? We know what their ideology is. We know what they believe. Are they an extremist group? And without a understanding what we mean by extremist, it becomes difficult to do that. Um, and so there are a couple of international law definitions of, of extremism. There's UN Security Council Resolution 2178 from 2014, which defines extremism as anything that is, and this is the quote, conducive to terrorism or sectarian violence. That covers a lot of stuff. That's a very broad term. Gets to everything from coherent worldviews and ideologies to local grievances and family feuds, right, are all potentially extremist. Um, and as you can imagine, that's not especially helpful because it doesn't really allow us to do the work that we need of distinguishing between this group, which has grievances and is maybe engaged in violence, but are not extremists in the sense that they then are um, can be can have the tools that that Ms. Ergberg has applied, right? Um, Another way that extremism is often uh, defined is that it, it, it gives you this sense of sort of being outside of the mainstream, right? There's this academic definition that extremism um, represents idea ideas that are opposed to a society's core values. Um, but take for this, take this as an example. Um, many Muslims, perhaps even a majority globally, support their governments taking steps to implement Islamic law, the Sharia. This is something I did my first dissertation research on, I wrote a book about it in the context of Nigeria. Um, is that an extremist thing to want? Well, it's the mainstream in a lot of societies, and so from that sense, it sort of fails that initial definitional test. It can't be extremist if it's what most people in a society believe. And even then, is it extreme to want your society governed by the rules that God lays out for your behavior? I meet a lot of people around the world who would, ag who would agree to that statement, right, sort of in a general sense. Is it extremist? Um, it matters how we end up defining these terms, right, for what we're going to classify as extremist or not. And I'm going to come back to that later. Um, now, governments that are committed to fighting extremism struggle with this definitional issue, definitional issue a lot. How do we counter extremism if we don't know what extremism is? And there are two kind of basic camps in the literature about this. One is that extremism is a cognitive thing. Um, being an extremist is having ex extremist views. And so to make this work, in effect, what you have to do at the strategic level is to predefine certain ideas or ideologies as extremist. Salafism, Salafi jihadism in the U.S. context, white supremacism, and then apply the label of extremist to groups that are individuals that espouse these beliefs. This has the advantage of clarity, right? It really allows us to say pretty, pretty certainly this group is extremist, this group isn't. This group is amenable to being countered or prevented along the lines that we've talked about. This group maybe has other, is going to require other tools. The disadvantage. Um, is that that labeling is not often done in a neutral way, even by governments that are very well-meaning and that understand deeply and coherently the ideologies that we're talking about. It's, it's difficult to apply consistently. An example that I could give you that sort of ripped from the headlines is the recent Nigerian government move, and they received a, an injunction from the federal high court a couple days ago to label the um, Islamic movement of Nigeria as a terrorist organization and as an extremist group. Um, this activates special legal and policing remedies to the protests that are going on in Nigeria and is seen as an expedient way of handling what's viewed in a lot of government and social circles as a big problem. But from my perspective, having worked in Nigeria for 15 years, it's difficult to tease out the difference between classifying a group like that as extremist because of their ideology as opposed to because of um, some pre-existing social animus, right? Um, is it analytically consistent to refer to groups as extremists if they don't necessarily espouse violence but are occasionally involved in violence? It's difficult to say, right? And it matters in terms of what we end up doing next. Another good example of this is Salafism, which I'm going to talk about um, in some detail here in a couple of minutes. If some Salafis end up interpreting their religious doctrine as justifying or mandating anti-system violence, does that mean that all Salafis are extremist, definitionally? What about all of the other believers, um, and we touched on this just a second ago, who don't believe in or don't believe in or practice violence? 
Does the relationship between some believers in violence justify analytically or legally declaring them all to be extremists, particularly if there's a sort of legal finding that's attached to that? Now, there is the other camp, and the other camp focuses on extremism as a behavior, right? Extremism is engaging in violence. Um, this is, this is more or less my view. There are challenges associated with this too. Um, and it's based again on evidence that we just heard about, that not all extremist actions are predicated on a linear progression of cognitive radical, radicalization from exposure to ideas to uptake of those ideas to engaging in violence. And so it helps us with, a, with some of those previous examples, right? Um, what about an ideology or a worldview that seems like it might justify violence, right? People sitting down and reading texts and saying, oh, it looks like these people condone violence, but not all of them are engaged in violence. In fact, many of them are not engaged in violence. This idea that extremism is fundamentally about behavior helps us to sort of remind ourselves that ideologies and worldviews don't usually actually have plain language readings. Right? It's not possible to simply sit down and look at a set of texts and conclude these are the extremists and these are the non-extremists. Many of the um, ideologies that I'm going to talk about um, in a few minutes here can be read as promoting violence, but the fact that many of their adherents don't read them that way is important. Right? It matters what the people who are part of that group, that movement, or who ascribe to that ideology think it means. Um, and this gets to the fact that sort of at a fundamental level, ideologies and worldviews are also about the power and influence associated with being able to say what those ideologies and worldviews mean in the first place. I can tell you what I think Salafism means, right? But my, my definition may not hold as much weight as somebody teaching at the Islamic University of Medina, for better or for worse. It could be that certain people are more well-regarded within their community, are in a better position to define for other adherents of that ideology what it means. And so I think it's more helpful to regard ideologies and worldviews, to excuse sort of a clumsy metaphor, as vehicles. Right? They can be piloted to violence, or they can be piloted away from violence. Um, and it matters very much who's doing the piloting in any particular context or society. Okay, so with that preamble out of the way, let's get into the specifics of the worldviews. And I was asked to talk about three definitional terms, Islamism, Salafism, and Jihadism. And I'm gonna wrap Salafism and Jihadism together for reasons that I think will become obvious in a second. But let's start with Islamism. Islamism is a clumsy term. Um, it's a clumsy term because it doesn't speak to a specific theology or doctrine. There are not many Muslims, at least today, that would refer to themselves as Islamists. It's a common way, rather, for outsiders, especially people in academics, to describe a broad range of positions that are linked together by their engagement with and efforts to transform the political system. Right? It's not a definition that people themselves ascribe to, but rather a, a sort of shorthand for people like us to think about these are groups that want to use their religious ideology to have an impact on the political system. As a result, I don't tend to use it in my own scholarship because I tend to prefer analytically terms and descriptions that groups themselves adopt. I think it's more helpful to know what a group calls itself than it is to know sort of what we might analytically call it from outside. That said, if you hear the term Islamism, and in French it's just l'islamisme, right? Um, what is generally being described are political movements along the lines of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which draw on a particular sort of 20th century ideological tradition, which is to say that it's a rel relatively new way of looking at the world, um, founded by people like Hassan al-Banna, Saeed Qutb, and Abdullah Maududi in Pakistan. It, Islamists generally tend to be skeptical of the West. They tend to be socially conservative and committed to the idea that it's possible to construct a so-called Islamic state, a society in which every aspect of political, social, and economic life is systematically governed by Islamic principle. That's sort of generally what they have in common. Now, it's worth pointing out at this juncture that this idea of the Islamic state isn't how classical Muslim authorities um, in places like the Abbasid Caliphate actually thought about things or how it worked. It is in some ways a claim that you're going to do something um, with reference to older models, but what you're actually going to do is not like those older models. Um, the key difference hinges on the belief of Islamists that there's a single, knowable, and correct way of interpreting the word of God and the legacy of the prophet and his companions that can guide all of the ways that a society works. Um, also that you can do it at the behest of a central political authority. This is not what classical Islamic jurisprudence actually looked like. If you were to drop someone espousing an ideology like this into the 12th or 13th century, 
that ideology would surprise a lot of people. In fact, classical Islamic jurisprudence was pretty pluralistic and it accepted the viability of lots of different schools of legal and jurisprudential interpretation. But again, Islamism really isn't a theological term. It's a way of lumping in a group of people that have common goals but often disagree pretty dramatically on the specifics. It's also, and I think that this is important for you all, not a term that describes many of the most important contemporary violent extremist groups especially well. You don't want to hear the term Islamism or Islamist and immediately jump to or conflate it with a lot of the violent extremist actors on the continent. Salafism, on the other hand, is a much more useful term in as much as it reflects a way of thinking about Islam that's actually used by Muslims to categorize and classify themselves. There are Muslims who exist in the world who call themselves Salafis. That makes it more helpful. There's a recognizable canon of Salafi theology and religious scholarship and lots of organizations that use that term. That said, there's still a lot of room for confusion. Well, pretty much all of the armed uh, non-state actors in Africa today led by Muslims espouse a Salafi version of Islam. But does this make Salafism extremist? And again, that depends a lot on how you define extremism. So let's unpack what Salafism is and then reflect back on that. So the term Salafi refers, and I'll apologize, my house is much better than my Arabic, so I'm going to butcher this, refers to the, um, the term al-Salaf al-Sali, the pious ancestors in the Islamic tradition. So Salafis are Sunni Muslims who are engaged in a self-conscious, which is to say that they know that they're doing it, intellectual and theological project to restore their religion to what they understand to be its simplest and most authentic form, which is to say the way that it was practiced by the Prophet and his companions. Theologically, Salafis regard the Quran as uncreated, it's always existed in the mind of God, and descriptions of God in the Quran as literally true. They generally reject metaphorical and philosophical approaches to religious texts, and can be seen as attempting to roll back the influence of that way of thinking. They strongly prioritize, and I'm going to assume a modicum of familiarity with the terminology here, the hadith and the sunnah, the, the sayings and doings of the prophet, as the only valid sources for understanding what God wants. Many reject the classical schools of Islamic law um, in favor of an insistence on direct engagement with the original texts. This is important because it means that Salafis understand themselves as only relying on the most sound and authoritative methods of interpretation, and as such, they see themselves as the only Muslims offering a correct interpretation of God's will, right? This sets them apart from that sort of tradition of pluralism and the possibility of there being lots of different correct ways of interpreting what's going on. Now, politically, Salafis are all over the place, but I see two important things that they have in common. The first is that they tend to regard themselves as speaking for all of Islam um, and as sort of having the sole responsibility for doing so. They tend to reject Islamic um, e existing religious hierarchies and leadership systems, right? These are not going to be the folks who you find in your oldest um, and, and, and most well-established Islamic schools. These are not the folks who are often trained locally. Um, in favor of the claim that anybody who applies the methods um, correctly to the texts can be a religious authority. This often means that Salafi leaders in your communities have a different kind of training and background than classical religious scholars. They may not have come up through 20 or 30 years of traditional Quranic education. They may be doctors, they may be engineers, they may be university professors in fields unrelated to religion, but they have learned that theory of textual analysis and they apply it independently. Um, second, Salafis tend to be aggressive in their claims that their beliefs are pure and correct and that the rest of the Muslim community needs to get with the program. So let's back up for a second. Salafis tend to regard themselves as practicing the pure, original, and correct faith. This means that they are often described by Westerners, by people um, sort of attempting to counter the ideology or understand the ideology around the world as ultra-conservative, strict, and purists. Sometimes you will even see them described as especially pious or devout. This reflects a certain amount of taking Salafi claims at face value, right? Um, that we're in effect parroting back the language that they use about themselves as factually true. So for example, one American think tank recently defined Salafism as holding that a Muslim's primary obligation and loyalty are to his religion and loyalty to country is always secondary. This was their definition of what Salafism is. I have spent a lot of time working in Muslim communities on the continent and I have not met a lot of Muslims who don't see themselves as Salafists who wouldn't also at least sort of agree with that. 
I think maybe you can see where I'm going with it at this point, right? Um, defining or describing Salafis in this way is tantamount to accepting their truth claims about their faith. Most non-Salafi Muslims would be surprised to hear that Salafis are especially pious, pure, and conservative because it tends to imply that other Muslims are not. This sort of thing is a good way to alienate non-Salafi Muslims, right? Who suddenly find themselves on defensive, having just been told that they're extremely learned sheikhs, the ones who did the Hajj, who memorized the Quran at eight, who have spent their lifetimes developing that knowledge of religion, are really just moderates, right? This is sort of not a helpful definitional terrain here that we've stumbled upon. Pretty much all Muslims would agree that the Sunnah and Hadith are the best sources for knowing God's will, and that it's good to emulate the Prophet and his companions. Most would agree that it's good to practice a pure version of their faith. They just happen to disagree with the Salafis about how to do that. This is important, right? So now let's come back to that question, are Salafis extremist? I think it's fair to describe so-called Salafi jihadis, Salafi activists who have theologically justified violent action against the political order and increasingly against Muslims who are in that political order and who call for the establishment of a caliphate as extremists. It's important to note though, and we heard this a second ago, that not all participants in Salafi jihadi movements are necessarily motiv motivated primarily by theology. Some of them don't even fully understand these nuanced theological arguments. Moreover, not all armed groups around the world are theologically jihadist. There are, um, for example, community-based armed, armed groups in northern and central Mali that appear to be sort of jihadist by convenience, right? But they're also motivated by a, by a long list of other grievances or potential issues. There are also Salafis who reject violence, but may regard secularism um, and, and liberal values, democracy, for example, as bad things. Because Salafism doesn't prescribe any particular political vision, there are lots of Salafis who work with governments and other Salafis who view it as wholly inappropriate. There are plenty of Salafis who espouse peace um, and, and, and counter the claim of Salafi jihadi groups that they have a right to jihad, but use conspiracy theories and violent rhetoric against Christians and Jews, for example. There are even Salafis who stay entirely out of politics, but preach behind closed doors the validity of uh, engaging in jihad today. It's very complicated, right? It's not just as easy as sort of going out and saying these are the bad guys, these are the good guys, these are the moderates, these are extremists. It is much more theologically complicated than that. It's even more complicated by the fact that there are plenty of non-Salafis, including the supposedly moderate Sufis of West Africa, who support policies like the state implementation of Sharia. Um, they often do so, and again, I wrote a book about this. I interviewed hundreds of Muslims in northern Nigeria um, for reasons that they view as entirely non-extremist, like attempting to restore a sense of economic and social justice to their societies. Right? So ultimately, and this is the sort of action, the thing that I think you can do with this. I come down on the side of an argument that's made by a Norwegian researcher named Thomas Heghammer, who's written a lot about Islamic extremism. And what he suggests is that rather than thinking about it in terms of Salafi versus non-Salafi, jihadi versus non-jihadi, we're better off thinking about it in terms of the preferences and the actions that these groups take. So some Salafi groups in your countries care most about changing how their national governments behave. Others are concerned primarily about promoting pan-Muslim unity that's bigger than the nation state. Just because they share a common ideology doesn't mean that they're gonna act the same way, and it's useful to remember that. Similarly, there are plenty of Salafi groups that also think about themselves not only in, uh, in religious terms, but in ethnic terms. What matters more from this framework is less their ideology and more do they have a track record of calling for and carrying out violence and to what end do they engage in that violence. I think it's more useful to cluster the groups that we're talking about in those terms than it is to say that these are the Salafis and these are the non-Salafis. This is especially useful, I think, given the fact that a lot of the continent's most deadly violent extremist actors are actually pretty generic and vague about what they actually want. And here, because of my background in the Lake Chad Basin, I think about uh, the Islamic State in West Africa and Boko Haram, who nominally are calling for the establishment of a so-called Islamic State, right? They disagree theologically about many things, and in practice, because their goal is mostly unattainable, they're not gonna do that. They focus on doing lots of other things as well. And so the differences between those groups and how they behave, what they want, how they act, 
are not just about the fact that they're both Salafi groups, but about all of these other things, these strategic contexts, um, and the fact that they're organizations that drive the differences and behaviors of lots of other kinds of non-Salafi groups as well. What matters from our perspective is that they understand themselves as Salafis. Um, that matters. But it matters even more that they have evolved a variety of different ways of actually conducting the fight and dividing them along the lines of how they conduct the fight, what their goals are, how they operate tactically and strategically is probably more helpful than thinking about them primarily in theological terms. Now, I've got a bunch more that I can say about this if you all have questions, but I'll stop now because I'd like to talk to you all. Thank you.